Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. We're going to be getting started shortly. Hello, everyone. I'm Corey Mullins with Iatric Systems, and I'd like to welcome you to our Patient Privacy and Security Webinar, Using AI to Protect Patient Data. If you're a privacy officer in compliance, or if you're simply just interested in how to maintain HIPAA compliance and keep data safe in an evolving landscape that's now including AI, you are definitely in the right place. Uh, as a reminder for everybody, this webinar is going to be recorded for quality purposes. A little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please let us know in the questions pane. You could find that on the right side of your screen, or you could simply email webp at iatric.com. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar, and you can enter those questions in that same questions pane. Um, we're going to be answering all the questions after today's presentation, but you know, don't feel like you have to wait until we have the question slide pop up. As they're coming up, feel free to put them in the chat, feel free to put them in the questions pane, and we'll address those as soon as possible. Uh, once the webinar ends, you are going to see a survey pop up, and we'd appreciate it if you could take a moment to fill that out and provide your feedback. We're always looking for ways to improve our webinars, our content, and everything else for our attendees, so your opinion matters, and we'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that survey out. Something that's a little bit different and to look out for in today's webinar is that we're going to have two interactive polls. Uh, we encourage you to participate as it's going to help our speakers gear their discussion towards your comfort with AI, um, and it's fairly easy to do. We're going to announce a poll once the, once the slides that are appropriate pop up. You're going to see a window come up on your screen and simply use those buttons to submit your answer, and we'll share the results uh, in a minute or so after you fill those out. Now, I wanted to go over the agenda of what's going to be talking about what we're um, speaking to today. Uh, we're going to start off with a broad discussion of AI, how it's helping the good guys, how it's helping the bad guys, what are the recent big impact attacks, and eventually transition over to well, what's the impact of AI on HIPAA? How is it transforming compliance? How are privacy officers and hospitals using it to protect PHI? And a little snippet at the end is going to be a topic of discussion for a future webinar being HICP. So um, right at the end, we'll give you a sneak peek in case you're interested in a future webinar topic. With that, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, Jerry and Demi Borden. Um, feel free to go ahead and get us started. Okay, thanks, Corey. Um, uh, I wanna thank Iatric, first of all, uh, our company's uh, Comply Assistant, I'm the CEO of Comply Assistant, uh, we're really good collaboration partners, and we look forward to doing these kind of activities in the future to continue them going. Comply System uh, was founded in 20 in 2002. Um, basically, we're privacy and security, and of course, cybersecurity uh, software and services. So um, we also have a GRC platform for software, which was um, deployed in 2010. So it's been around for 14 years. Governance, risk, and compliance software. And from a service standpoint, uh, basically at a high level, what we try to do is, as good guys, find the gaps with um, healthcare organizations uh, before the bad guys do. Um, so what we want to do next is to take that poll that Corey mentioned about the, your AI comfort level. So Corey, uh, do you want to take it from there with the poll? There we go. Yep, and everybody, you should see a poll pop up on your screen. So take a minute or two and we'll go ahead and answer that. We'll give it a couple more seconds, but it looks like just about everybody's answered already. And you should be able to see the answers on your screen. So it's kind of evenly 
spread, but I see that everyone's being honest because no one said very comfortable, and that's an honest answer. This is kind of new. All right. So um, the next slide is, I don't know why I'm getting uh, clicks here. I can move it forward. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, it got stuck. Um, so the next poll is how old is AI? We'll give it a couple more seconds, but it looks like just about everybody's answered. Mm, two years, 14%, 20, okay. Interesting. Well, I think um, most, if not all of you, will be surprised to learn that it is actually about 70 years old. Overall. So now, Corey, I'm clicking again, so maybe you can move me um, one more time. You should be good now. Now, for some reason, I lost uh, the ability to move it. So now my mouse is wrong. Okay. So anyway, so we know that, um, you know, the, the 70 years of AI have resulted in a bunch of acronyms. Um, and we know that in healthcare, we all love acronyms, right? So um, some of the acronyms for AI are ML, and I'm going to go over what these mean. NLP, um, LLM, GPT. I'm sure that you've all heard of GPT recently. We have ANI, AGI, and TLA. And GPT, again, CAI. And all that adds up to what everybody calls AI. So there's all these other acronyms around it, which makes it somewhat um, difficult to really get your arms around because of all of these different aspects. So we'll go to the next one. And we'll talk about the first acronym is machine learning. So what is machine learning? Uh, basically, it's the use and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions, but using ag algorithms and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences and patterns in data. And, and all these first ones that I'm talking about all go back to like around 1955, but in the 2000s to the present with big data um, and more powerful computing resources, machine learning has advanced rapidly. Uh, with the ability of image and speech recognition capabilities and things like that. So while the foundational ideas of machine learning go back 70 years, the field has continuously evolved and expanded, especially in the last two decades. Next one is large language model. Um, so large language model, again, goes way back and it is as advanced um, or advanced AI systems capable of understanding and generating human language with high proficiency. Now, um, you'll recognize examples of large language models are the GPT, uh, the chat GPTs, there's version three and four that just came out. There's BERT, which is uh, developed by Google. There's T5, which is developed by Google also. Um, and T5 converts all natu uh, natural language processing into text-to-text -text format. So we're, not, we're going to try to stay away from getting too technical here, but I'm just trying to give some background on what these acronyms mean. Now, some of the limitations around large language models are that training and deploying of them requires significant uh, computerization power. So it's very expensive and pretty much accessible primarily to large healthcare organizations and organizations in general. There's bias and ethics. So large language models can inherently or inadvertently learn and propagate biases. And if, if you've heard about that, presented in the training data. So these models get trained, they're used for training, 
and they could have biases that lead to ethical concerns regarding their use and potential for harmful outputs. And in healthcare, that could obviously be a problem. Um, interpretability, the decisions and outputs of LLMs can be difficult to interpret, posing challenges for understanding and debugging their behavior. From a data privacy standpoint, um, LLMs trained on large data sets might inadvertently memorize and, repro and pro reproduce sensitive information, raising privacy concerns. So this is why there's a lot of concerns around it. Everyone's uh, looking at what could be the good and what could be the bad of uh, AI. There's natural language processing, uh, like machine language has a rich history, uh, but recently the field saw a major breakthrough with the advent of deep learning, with advanced, which advanced the state of the art of various NLP tasks, which is uh, the natural language processing, including language understanding, translation, and text generation. The one that's, um, uh, there's artificial narrow intelligence, which is the next one, and this is the one that's really in effect today. Um, and you see this with um, virtual assistants like Apple Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Google Assistant, um, algorithms used by Netflix, Amazon, and Spotify to suggest movies, products, or music based on user preference and behavior, image and speech re recognition, um, all systems that can identify objects um, in images or convert speech to text like transcription services. Um, autonomous vehicles, so um, self-driving cars can use AI to navigate and make driving decisions, and we see that developing. Uh, we hear about it all the time. Medical diagnosis uh, diagnosis systems, AI tools that assist doctors by analyzing medical images or patient data um, to diagnose diseases. Now, there is also artificial general and artificial super intelligent intelligence, but it's really the artificial narrow that is the current state of AI technology where systems are highly effective um, within their specific domains but lack versatility and general understanding of human intelligence. So it hasn't gotten as far as obviously being able to behave like, like, a, like a human brain. There's conversational AI, which is very similar to everything I've talked about up to now. And then you get into the GPT, the generative uh, pre-trained transformer. And this GPT, which was uh, version three in 2020, and now four actually came out in 2023. And of course, oh, and there's one more. Here's, a, here's a, something for you all to think about. We'll go over it at the end. Uh, what does TLA mean? Okay, I'm not gonna tell you right now. It's for all of you to guess. So, um, so it is the chat GPT that made the buzz in, tw in November 2022 and got everybody talking about it. Um, everyone, uh, a lot of vendors are claiming to be AI, uh, that they have AI in their applications. But the key thing is with everything I just went through, all those different components, what does it really mean? What do they really have? And they really do need to be vetted uh, and also vetted from a privacy and security standpoint, which we're going to talk about once we get further down towards HIPAA. So what is the evolution of risk to PHI? Um, so basically it comes down to over the years, motivation is of course money and vulnerabilities. Um, so the motivation to the attackers and to people who breached data or did uh, wrong things with um, breaching. Uh, and I'll go over some of those, but just to give you um, some background, back in the 70s and 80s, basically there were dumb terminals, uh, not not workstations, and there was uh, really no motivation because there was no money to be made, uh, and so no no real vulnerabilities around data. It was in very few locations, mainframes and hard copy. But then in the 1990s, you see here that smart workstations came out uh, widespread just distributed service moving uh, information stored from one one computer room out to departments um, employees were selling PHI uh, in fact one of the uh, first stories was Arthur Ashe uh, story his story was sold to the National Enquirer around that time that he was HIV positive and he of course did not want that to be known 
with somebody new and they sold it to the National Enquirer to make money. So there's the motivation is money. Um, and that's where it really started right around there. Then of course, snooping, uh, you know, employees snooping on um, records in, um, you know, systems um, with some of the um, activities like selling employees sold um, emergency room charts to lawyers for money um, and things like that. Uh, you know, the HIPAA rule came into effect in the early 2000s, but it really was signed in 1996 uh, with this activity starting to occur. In the, in the 2000s, with the portable devices, there was, you know, the, one of the most common breaches was a lost laptop, unencrypted, um, and emails that were unencrypted, more insider breaches. And anytime there was a breach that infected 500 patients in one state, that organization went on the HHS wall of shame. I don't know if they still have that, but that's what it was at that time. I think it still is in existence. The problem today is that it isn't 500 patients anymore. It's millions at times with uh, you know the cyber attacks. 2010s, meaningful use brought the transition from hard copy to um, electronic medical records. Um, and the security aspects of it were kind of check the box, but not necessarily um, comprehensive. So attackers knew this and they started to go after the electronic data because it was, um, you know, motivational for money and also vulnerable. The, and other things like Internet of Things, interoperability, the EMR, the more EMRs, M&As, mergers and acquisitions, uh, that kind of environment can cause vulnerabilities when organizations are merging, uh, so attackers know that. Uh, and phishing attacks started, ransomware, and then in 2015, as a result, HHS, well, the government formed the uh, Cybersecurity Act, which commissioned HHS, Health and Human Services, to develop um, HICP, which is the Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices Rule. And um, that's going to come up in a future webinar as, um, as well. Uh, bigger attacks in the 2020s, uh, where we are now, and extended downtimes. We've seen systems that uh, normally three days of downtime was a lot. They were down for up to five weeks or more. Um, change healthcare, look at the national impact of um, that uh, ransomware attack uh, affected nationwide and I think 7,000 organizations, just an unbelievable impact. And of course, with the AI and ChatGPT, that's um, also a concern. You know, it's it's good from everything that it could do from use cases in healthcare, but it's also adds to more vulnerabilities and potential for uh, attack. And with the large language models, is is um, areas you know storage uh, areas of um, very large uh, volumes of of data and a lot of PHI. And of course, that's going to be a big motivation for attackers. So it's a big concern. So whenever there's new technology over the years, there's the change management that needs to occur. So change management is the only change is the only constant. Um, and so normally the cycle is policies and procedures and plans are put in place. We see that now for AI, workforce training around it, um, with like for example, with phishing becoming more um, dangerous with AI because it looks so real and with deep fakes, if you heard of that term, uh, workforce training comes into play there. Vendor onboarding and vetting, now AI has to be brought into that uh, and any vendor claiming to be using AI has to be vetted. Privacy and security risk uh, assessments uh, need to include AI as well and um, strong governance over it. So hospitals, health systems, Healthcare organizations are now forming AI governance committees and, um, act, you know, positions for directors of AI, uh, you know, folks that are overseeing AI, all the use cases in healthcare. So then, then the cycle just continues. So how can uh, AI help the good guys? So we have threat detection and response, um, anomaly detection. If there's um, an attacker on the network causing an anomalies, machine learning algorithms can distinguish between normal and suspicious activities, allowing for real-time detection of potential threats, as opposed to uh, sometimes it took 
um, up to 200 days to know that there was somebody on, on your network. There's intrusion detection systems, uh, IDS that are AI powered. There's endpoint detection that are AI powered. Um, predictive analysis is next. So threat intelligence, AI can analyze vast amounts of data from various sources, such as dark web forums, social media, threat databases to predict potential threats. Um, so this pro uh, proactive approach allows organizations to prepare for and mitigate attacks before they occur. Behavioral analysis, by analyzing historical data, AI can predict potential insider threats based on deviations from normal user behavior. And, um, and Demi will talk more about that. Automation and efficiency is next. Automated incident response. So AI can actually automate routine security tasks, such as patch management, vulnerability scanning, threat hunting. Um, so instead of doing that manually, AI can do it and take it away from uh, the teams that are trying to do other things in the event of uh, an incident. Um, enhanced fraud detection, real-time transaction monitoring, identity uh, verification, AI can enhance identity verification processes by analyzing biometric data such as facial recognition and fingerprint scanning to ensure that users are who they claim to be and now we also have the multi-factor authentication which is very helpful um, that's not necessarily ai but that is a great control improved email security is next um, phishing detection ai can analyze email content metadata and user behavior to detect detect phishing attempts um, spam filtering, AI can in improve spam filters by continuously learning from new types of spam and adjusting its filters accordingly, reducing the risk of phishing and other email-based attacks. There's network security, firewall management, AI can optimize firewall rules by analyzing network traffic patterns. Uh, DDoS, so AI can detect distributed denial of service attacks by monitoring traffic patterns and distinguishing between normal spikes in traffic and malicious activities. User authentication, adaptive authentication. AI can enhance authentication mechanisms by implementing adaptive authentication methods that can consider the context of login attempt, such as the user's location, device, and behavior. If an attempt is deemed suspicious, additional verification steps can be required. Password security, AI can analyze password patterns and usage to identify weak or compromised passwords prompting users to change them and enhance overall security. Also, that is also where multi-factor comes into play to enhance that um, type of security. Continuous learning and improvement, AI-driven security analytics. AI can continuously analyze security data to identify new threats and adapt its models accordingly. And threat hunting, I think I mentioned before. So that's how it can help the good guys in many ways. Now, how can it help the bad guys? So we know that there's good and bad. So with the bad guys, AI can automate and enhance phishing attacks. Uh, AI can analyze social media profiles, emails, and other online data to craft highly personalized phishing messages, increasing the likelihood of the recipient falling for the scam. Email spoofing, AI tools can gener generate emails that mimic the writing style of specific individuals making phishing emails more convincing. Evasion techniques, there's adversarial attacks. Um, AI can use, uh, attackers can use AI to create ad adversarial examples that trick machine learning models. Um, there's polymorphic malware where they can develop malware that changes its code uh, dynamically to evade detection. There's um, automated vulnerability discovery, exploit deployment, AI can be used to scan software and systems for vulnerabilities more efficiently than manual methods. Zero-day exploits, AI can help identify unknown vulnerabilities such as zero-day and develop exploits to take advantage of these security gaps before they are patched. The social engineering, I mentioned deepfake. Um, this is a scary one because it can lead to more convincing social engineering attacks. For example, attackers could create fake videos of CEOs giving fraudulent instructions to employees. Voice phishing, which is called vishing. AI can mimic the voices of trusted individuals to, to deceive victims over the phone, leading to successful attacks. There was an example in Hong Kong of um, an employee who took instructions from what he thought it was the CFO, COO, and CEO to transfer 25 million to another organization, and it turns out it was not them. Um, 
enhanced brute force attacks, password cracking, capture solving. I won't go into detail there. Reconnaissance and targeting. Um, and then just to go down the list, there's distributed denial of service uh, uh, attacks. There's malware development, which we talked about, exploiting AI defenses, bypassing AI defenses, and poisoning attacks. So there's plenty of ways that it helps the bad guys. Uh, it's just a matter of who wins the battle. On these big attacks that occurred, um, Thanksgiving Day 2023 saw multiple hospitals across the country, all part of Arden Health Services, um, and they experienced IT disruptions. Uh, February 21 was the change healthcare, uh, you know, breach or attack that all of us were familiar uh, familiar with for the most part. Look at the numbers of um, pharmacies that were down. Um, a lot of um, small organizations like pharm smaller pharmacies actually went out of business because they couldn't generate any uh, cash. That was the Black Cat Group. Um, Ascension on May 8th, 2024. Another big one affecting um, um, all kinds of downtime, extended downtimes, and um, not being able to get to my chart and things like that. So, what is the impact of AI on HIPAA from a data privacy and security standpoint? Um, protected health information. So, AI systems often require access to large data sets that include PHI. Ensuring that this data is anonymized or de-identified is crucial. Access controls. AI systems must implement robust access controls to ensure that only authorized person can access PHI. Um, data security and integrity, encryption, must be in place. Uh, you know, both in transit and at rest must be encrypted uh, to protect against unauthorized access. Data integrity, ensuring the integrity of data that is essential. AI systems must protect data from unauthorized alterations, which could lead to incorrect diagnoses, and how scary is that, and, and treatment recommendations and protocols. Risk management, regular risk management must be done regarding AI. It must be an incident response plan due to the fact that um, we talked about the extended downtimes, uh, compliance and accountability, audit trails, the AI systems should maintain detailed logs of data. You know, and a lot of these um, these impacts on HIPAA are really things that are in place now, but just being extended now because of AI. But all these must be considered. Vendor management is another one. Additional questions around AI should be posed to vendors upon onboarding. Um, there's, let's see, third-party risks. Um, third-party third-party vendors handling PHI must adhere to the same standards as covered entities. We know that. Um, should be over here. Uh, let's see here. I think I got past a lot of this stuff already. So um, data privacy and security measures, uh, encryption and access controls we talked about, audit trails and monitoring, ethical considerations um, around biases. So um, AI systems must be evaluated for biases that could lead to unfair treatment of certain patient groups. Ethical use of data, the ethical implications of AI used in healthcare must be considered. Um, and then patient rights. So patient rights, the uh, access to information patients have the right to access the medical records and um, understand how the data is being used by AI systems and be able to correct it. So again, the impact is really the fact that um, all of the HIPAA uh, requirements, standards, implementation specs, um, are now being extended out to AI. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Demi. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, I really liked your comparison of um, how AI can be used to help both the good guys and the bad guys out there. There's just so much that AI can do. Um, another way that AI can help the good guys is by helping with insight and analytics in the data um, when it comes to patient privacy. There are patient privacy monitoring solutions out there that use AI to alert privacy teams of inappropriate access to PHI. The AI and machine learning capabilities in these solutions, it learns health systems patterns to help identify inappropriate access. That way patient privacy teams can focus on the truly suspicious behavior. 
um, having these solutions, learning and recognizing these patterns with the use of AI helps privacy experts detect anomalous, anomalous behavior by distinguishing before, between the normal access of protected health information and then the activities that fall outside of the norm and rep represent a potential breach. Um, the AI in this software, it will automatically monitor millions of PHI accesses across a health system every day, examining the data from multiple, multiple perspectives to pinpoint suspicious activity while minimizing time spent analyzing this data on their own by themselves. This is saving so much time for the hospital staff while protecting the patients and the hospital along the way. And it really makes you wonder how privacies are doing it without the use of technology or before incorporating AI, which I do want to explore a little bit. So managing patient privacy, very daunting task. Um, there's so much data flying around in so many different systems. A lot of the time, privacy teams don't know where to start or are left wondering what they're supposed to be looking for in the first place. So if not using AI to help sift through this mountain of data, how exactly are teams supposed to be identifying any issues that may be going on? Well, there are two different workflows that could be used. The first is being proactive in identifying issues. And what that means is teams are kind of getting their feet dirty and they're actively seeking out um, suspicious or inappropriate behavior when it comes to users accessing patient records. Um, what they're doing is they, they have to manually check audit trails, make sure there isn't anyone snooping in records that they shouldn't be in. The second approach is being kind of reactive in privacy practices. Being reactive is when those investigations um, begin only once a tip or a complaint is called in. There's not much or very little, no, no time at all, being spent actually searching for inappropriate behaviors before those complaints or tips are made and called in. And this is often because of a lack of time or resources, especially with, again, how much data there is to manually sift through and analyze. It's really easy to get into that reactive habit, especially if privacy teams don't have any tools to help them identify inappropriate accesses. Um, with that being said, another question is what tools privacy teams do have right from the start to aid in identifying inappropriate access without the use of AI to help analyze the data. And a lot of the time with that, the answer is not really anything. And that makes this, again, a very manual process. Privacy teams are left pulling very general access reports from the EHR that has endless data. They're sifting through every access, trying to see if there's any anomaly that needs to be investigated. And then once they do identify an access that needs de deeper investigation or a tip or a complaint is called in, now they're having to pull separate reports on a specific user or a specific patient a lot of the time across multiple systems and try to piece together manually a timeline or paint the picture of what was accessed and why but how much time is that taking these teams it would be hours or even days depending on the type of investigation how are these teams supposed to get their arms around everything that is going on when finding and investigating just one anomaly takes up so much of the team's time and energy? This is why we need to start thinking about how we can start working smarter and finding and using this technology that's out there to help us land on top of the this mountain that is privacy. Um, so what is it that people are doing and how can AI help identify it exactly? Well, when it does come to what people are actually doing and what can be a risk to your patient's privacy, I like to break it down and explain it in the three C's of inappropriate access. These break down behavior and risks into groupings of carelessness, concern, and curiosity. For carelessness, this can be things such as PHI accidentally being sent to the wrong patient, or maybe a proxy was added to the wrong account. Um, as patient portals have become a norm, it can even be adding results or notes to the wrong portal. These types of actions, they're going to happen. This is natural human error, and the best that we can do to help keep these actions to a minimum is to correct by intervention. 
That can be through regular education, reminders of how to properly document, track, and link personal information of patients. The next pillar of concern, we have access to patient data. Um, that's where access to patient data that people make out of concern for the health of their loved ones or themselves. This is a lot of the time more of a policy violation than actual breaches. This could be users looking into their own records or checking up on appointments for themselves or loved ones. Um, it could be checking lab results or notes on a spouse or a child that is being cared for. Um, people can feel as though it really isn't an issue to do this, especially if they have full access to that person's patient portal, um, that loved one's patient portal. They may feel that because they have the permissions within the portal, it's not a really big deal for them to just quickly take a peek at the charts. The final pillar here is curiosity, and these are much of the time true HIPAA violations and breaches. These lead to reported concerns and internal investigations. This can be checking in on a coworker that called in sick and you heard was down in the ER, or maybe there's a VIP patient that was in an accident that is all over the news. It's a friend or a neighbor that you saw in passing on your way into work and you just wanna see what they were doing here. Um, I've even heard a story from one of the privacy officers I worked with about finding someone who was screening the he health records of their potential dates. So there's a lot of different ways that people can get the information they want um, right away. I mentioned a moment ago in the, that last slide there that we need to start thinking about how to work smarter and what technology is out there to help us land on top of the mountain that is privacy. And to me, a mountain is a really great analogy. So if you think of patient privacy as this mountain, then all the data flow that you have going on with all these different systems, all this access that's going on, um, all the departments and the people that these privacy teams need to keep a watchful eye on is the towns and valleys at the base of this mountain, surrounding this mountain. So if your base for privacy is also at the base of the mountain, that means your team is trying to run in circles around this man at, at this mountain to manage everything that is going on surrounding it. Um, they're literally tearing through forests, um, essentially by manually sifting through all this data. It's a forest of data. Having technology such as the patient privacy monitoring solution that uses AI and automation and then everything else that comes with it can be a major tool in a team's belt in helping them get ahead of any problems that may arise. It, um, this technology uses the AI, um, it's how you can save time finding inappropriate access from the pillars of concern and curiosity, giving you more time to educate your staff and keep up with all that education. Um, this elevates your team to the top of the mountain, essentially, giving your team the bird's eye view of everything that's going on um, and also the tools to tackle anything that might be found. Um, this will then also lead you to uncover trends and take you on your way to, again, better educating staff. And that will prevent repeat occurrences and diminish the actions that incur in all three pillars that are cause for concern. So I wanna take a look at what tracking incidents looks like with and without incorporating AI and automation. So prior to incorporating AI and automation, identifying and tracking incidents can be, um, as I mentioned a few times, time consuming and tedious, again, often taking days. Without these systems teams, they have to manually pull in information and have very limited reports to use. This hinders workflows and can cause things to slip through the cracks very easily. After incorporating AI and automation, there is more time to cover more ground. So with the AI parsing the data and alerting to suspicious behavior for these teams, um, it's essentially pre preventing fatigue from plaguing those teams. This leads to a more seamless switch from a reactive auditing approach that a team might have been stuck in to a proactive auditing approach where they're trying to get ahead of any, um, any complaints or tips that are thrown their way. This monitoring software uses AI and automation to help teams uncover suspicious behavior. So that way you're not spending countless hours sifting through that data um, themselves. It's finding that needle in the haystack for them and bringing it to the forefront to investigate. AI will help 
identify when users make accesses that are atypical to not only their own workflow, but also the workflow of others in their same role. Machine learning within the systems will keep a watchful eye on what types of accesses are deemed appropriate and help filter those out. Geolocation is used in these systems um, to help identify neighborhood snooping by comparing user and patient addresses. Um, these systems pinpoint when there are inappropriate coworker accesses, familial accesses, VIP accesses, and more. Another perk to solutions like these is having the option to automate certain tasks. So with some systems, you get a virtual assistant that you can automate to watch for certain types of access and automatically send follow-up emails to the user or managers for more information. This can streamline those repetitive tasks that are bogging teams down. Um, that way they can focus on the tasks that can't be automated and spend time uncovering and managing trends and educating the staff. Um, speaking with another privacy team, um, I heard them tell a story of how they had a virtual assistant with their system who helped alert the privacy team to an inappropriate access of a very high profile patient that was being seen, one who was on national news. Um, having the virtual assistant tip them off um, within 24 hours of this access occurring, they were able to jump right into action and follow up with that user. Word spread that accessing the record was being watched closely, so they potentially avoided multiple other users accessing the record without a work-related reason to be in there. Um, being able to jump in and react as soon as possible like that when anything inappropriate occurs can be a real game changer in staying one step ahead. You can think of this automation as being a way to streamline the gathering of information for you as well. Maybe you have a certain question that you always ask when there's been a family access, such as, did you have a work-related reason to be in there? Do you have rights to view this information in the portal instead? Is that what you should have done? Um, that's a manual email or phone call that you have to make, but having that virtual assistant, you can assign it to automatically gather certain information in certain cases, taking that task completely off the plate of these privacy teams. Once the information is gathered, your team can pick up the information and complete the investigation. It may seem kind of like a small task being taken off the plate, um, but those add up really quickly um, to account for a lot of time. So because now you have AI identifying inappropriate behavior and automation kicking off the investigation and starting to gather information for you right off the bat. So that's, again, a real game changer when it comes to patient privacy. So with that being said, we want to know if there are any questions out there. So I know, Corey, you've been monitoring the chat and may have seen a few pop up. Yeah, and a quick reminder for everybody, I know we're coming up at the top of 45 minutes, so we may go a little bit over, but we still have a few minutes for questions. Um, as a reminder, if you do have a question, you could enter it in the right side of your screen under the questions pane um, or even inside the chat. We'll be monitoring both. Uh, we did call a couple questions from previous webinars or customer conversations to get the conversation started. So the, the first one I have for you, Jerry, was do you expect to see any formal changes to HIPAA rules uh, in regards to or due to AI? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the um, HIPAA security rule um, with the standards and implementation specs are not going to formally change. They're just going to be applicable to AI um, with some of the examples I went over before. I think um, what will uh, need to be taken into account is that HIPAA security risk assessments will need to incorporate AI um, and um, the vetting of third party vendors would also need to take into account extra questions around AI. Um, I think it's really the health industry cybersecurity practices rule, HICP, that would be the one which is an extension of HIPAA security to take into account um, potential change, formal changes in there around AI. So HICP is where that would likely occur. And then from the privacy standpoint, which I'm sure Demi can talk about as well, I would think, you know, because it's such a large volumes of data, minimum necessary would come into play, data sharing, data use, um, patient consents, maybe um, updates to the notice of privacy practices, um, BA agreements 
around AI when the you know the vendors are using AI. Um, so that's why I could see that coming into play. So probably between um, the two of them, the privacy rule could have some you know formal changes, updates, and HICP, but probably not uh, HIPAA security overall as a framework. Yeah, I think that's great. And it looks like we do have a question for you, Demi, which is how do we start incorporating AI into patient privacy? Well, I think the biggest thing you can do is um, looking out there and finding a system that works with you guys that already has it in place. Um, so getting a system that analyzes user behavior, getting a system that um, pulls in that geolocation and can really get down into the nitty gritty and find these inappropriate accesses um, because doing it yourself, it, it, there's just so much data out there. Data is not locked behind a door on paper in paper records anymore. It's flying around, it's on every single computer. So it's having a system in place, um, a tool in place that can actually give you that leverage and again, bring you to the top of that mountain. No, I think that's great. And it looks like that was the the last question we had in chat, but for, for the essence of time, I think, you know, the last question that I have for you two is really, how would people get in touch with you if they wanna continue the conversation? Okay, so I'll start. Um, you can see my email address there, Jerry at compliancesystem.com. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, I do have um, some other articles and stuff around AI that I could share. Uh, there's also a, another um, panel that we did on AI that I have uh, a PDF of the content there. So feel free to um, reach out to me and I'll send you that information. Yeah, and you can contact me at demi.borden at iatric.com. Um, feel free to reach out to me for more information on how Iatric Systems' own patient privacy monitoring solution, Haystack IS, can help your privacy team, again, land on top of that privacy mountain and start using AI and automation to get ahead of any potential incidents or breaches. Great, thanks Demi, thanks Jerry. Uh, a quick sneak peek, uh, as far as a topic for a future webinar is gonna be revolving around HICP. Um, so you see a quick snippet here on the screen, but if you're interested in, in this topic, as well as hearing some more best practices around the patient privacy side, um, stay tuned to our emails from Iatric Systems and, and future webinars, as we will be able to kind of delve into this a little bit more in detail, going over the top five threats, the controls, as well as, again, best practices on the privacy side. From now until then, um, there are resources and knowledge on demand available at 405d.hhs.gov. You can see at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to go there, brush up on it if it sounds like something you're interested in. Uh, once that webinar rolls around, we'll, we'll be able to delve a little bit more deep. Again, I'd like to say thank you to Jerry and Demi and everybody else on this call for joining our webinar today. As a reminder, there's gonna be a survey at the close of our webinar, and we appreciate it if you could go ahead and fill that out. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us on social media, please feel free to do so. And of course, if you have further questions or just would like to have a more in-depth conversation um, with either Comply Assistant or uh, iatric systems about our haystack privacy monitoring solution feel free to reach out to jerry individually demi on her side as well or you can always reach out to info at iatric.com and we'll be sure to connect you with the right resources again thank you everybody for joining and i hope everyone has a great day